सकते हैं All right, we'll call this meeting to order of the Tennessee Fish and Wildlife Commission. Uh, today is full commission day, and um, all votes will be taken by the full commission. We do want to welcome you all and thank you for being here. I'm going to call at this time. I'm going to ask Commissioner Connie King if she would lead us in the invocation and then the pledge afterwards. Our Father God, we just bow before you humbly knowing that um, we are serving not only our state, but you. We thank you for the wisdom that you give us. We thank you for the help. We thank you for the beautiful creation. We especially thank you for all those that uh, serve uh, in this capacity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Commissioner King. You're going to have to give us slow men a little more time to turn around, though. Right, Jim? <laughs> yep. Danette, would you call the roll, please? Angie Box. Here. Jim Ripley. Here. Dennis Gardner. Here. Jimmy Granberry. Here. Steve Jones. Here. Connie King. Here. Tony Sanders. Here. James Stroud. Kent Woods. Here. Tommy Woods. Here. Hank Wright. Here. Brian McLaren. Here. Kurt Holbert. Here. Chairman, we have a quorum. Thank you, Danette. We will be taking public comment today um, when we are speaking on the subject that you're here about um, you're welcome to when I ask for public comment stand up and take or give comments you will be limited to three minutes um, as normal um, I would ask that you keep those comments relative to what to the subject we're speaking about please turn your cell phones off during the meeting if you need to talk please step outside and do so you have commissioners you have a copy of the last month's minutes either on your iPads or in front of you on in your notebook. Do I hear a motion for approval? Motion from Commissioner Granberry. Do I have a second? Second. Second from Commissioner Ripley. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, like sign. Motion carried. Is there any announcements from any commissioners? Director Wilson, do you have any announcements? I do, Chairman. Uh, thank you. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements. You may recall, I don't know when it was, about a week ago, I guess, a conservation officer down in Florida was killed uh, off duty, but he was killed. And so uh, we sent a couple of our honor guards, two honor guards, Nick Looper and Brandon Taylor down there. They went, they drove down and, uh, to be part of the ceremony. And uh, they actually, we didn't have to tell them or anything. They volunteered. They wanted to go. So <coughs> pretty cool they went down there. Also, this the last two weeks, we uh, this time of year, we interview for the new wildlife officers, the vacancies that are open. We had nine openings. Uh, originally we had over 100 applicants that applied. We, uh, we took out all those that weren't, didn't have a wildlife or fisheries degree and we interviewed actually 41 on the first round. And then uh, out of those 41, we brought back 19 to interview again. Some of those had, this was their second or third time to interview and uh, we selected nine this past week and I think they're gonna offer them today. So we won't tell you who they are, but uh, we'll just say we got nine. And, and then speak of interviews, um, they were conducted last week. 
for uh, my replacement for the uh, deputy director over the field operations. And we had uh, seven people that <clears throat> were actually interviewed. And uh, we, the, uh, the person that was selected was Jason Maxidon out of West Tennessee. And Jason is here. Where's Jason? Yeah, there he is. Stand up. So anyway. <laughs> Jason, uh, of course, is from West Tennessee. He's got degrees from UT Martin and UT Knoxville and uh, a lot of experience on the forestry and, and the wildlife in West Tennessee. And we look forward to him serving in the role as deputy director. He'll start officially Sunday, and he'll be here Monday morning for our budget reviews that take place next week and the week after. So that's all I have. Thank you. Good deal. Thank you, Bobby, and congratulations, Deputy Director Maxidon. So that's hard to say. I would, you know, we've all aggravated Director Wilson about the big shoes he has to fill, but we won't say that much. But no, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, we look forward to seeing you in that position, though, and what you're going to do. Um, I will say this about the officer interviews, and, and Bobby, this is a, a compliment to whoever the interview panel is. I know Colonel Ryder and Lieutenant Colonel Taylor, Taylor are definitely involved in those, but it amazes me every time of, of the process you guys go through and and if you want to call it weeding them out but you guys seem to always come up with the best however many it is eight ten whatever that is but uh, i just want to compliment our our guys that are and girls that are on that panel um, our majors and our lieutenant colonels and captains but uh, anyway i just want to say that yes and if i may say one more thing about the deputy director interviews that of the seven, all seven were well qualified. They're all agency in-house applicants, and any any one of seven could have been a, a, a deputy director. It was really hard choice to make, and I uh, lost a lot of sleep over the last past weekend trying to to uh, to come up with that. And and uh, but anyway, a, a good pool of, of applicants. Appreciate all of them. I'm not going to say who they were, but appreciate all of them, and and they were dedicated and spent a lot of time with them. So just want to announce that too. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our agenda is not necessarily in order today. Um, and Director Wilson have worked on it and swapped some stuff around. But first, we're going to call on uh, our fisheries chief, Frank Fiss. Thank you, Chairman, Commissioners. I'll see if I can get this. Rich, are you open? And yes. Okay, great. So today, I want to. I'm going to go off the agenda a little bit and start off by talking about the upcoming listening sessions that we have just to announce to the public uh, the, the intent of these sessions is to hear what's on people's mind about fishing in general any questions they have about how we do things in, in fishing and we're going to use this information as we work towards regulation changes in calendar year 21 so our, our first meeting they're, they're not going to be pub public in the sense that you can come to a place they're going to be on Facebook live and our first meeting is going to be in, to represent the middle Tennessee fisheries which is basically uh, you know the the southern lakes woods Normandy Tim's Ford uh, all the way up to Dale Hollow and and, and Cordell Hole area so we're going to kind of doing a fisheries grand division if you will so this will be the first meeting on on July 9th the second meeting will represent West Tennessee waters, pretty much Kentucky and Barkley Lakes West. And then the third meeting will be July 16th, and that will cover the East Tennessee waters, basically the Tennessee River, East Tennessee River, uh, Tennessee River watershed, if you will, and all the lakes that connect to it. So we hope to have the public uh, send in questions and comments ahead of time to kind of give us an indication of where they're headed, and then we'll take questions uh, through Facebook live during the meeting as well we we don't have any experience doing this so we're going to have a lot of fun with it i hope and do a good job but we're pretty pretty excited about the opportunity just want to have everyone this on everyone's calendar so what i'm here to talk about today is our angler recognition programs and we have we have four of them that i'm going to go over i'll spend a little more time on the tarp program than the others but let's uh let's start at the beginning first fish when we talk about R3, you know, we're talking about recruitment. This program is to recognize someone's first fish caught in Tennessee. We 
we will provide this certificate free of charge if they contact us and fill out the little form that's online or just call us and give us the information. And we'll mail out a certificate to people to usually it's someone's, someone's kid or uh, that catches their first fish and we're happy to do that. We've sent over 2,000 out by the fisheries division, but it's also available if you're, you're, if you're just home online and want to print one out for yourself and you, it's pretty neat. You can, you know, you could put, fill one out on your own and put the kid's picture on there and make a little keepsake for their first fish. So that, that's what this program's about. Again, it's free, kind of connects to that recruitment phase of it. And uh, you're never too old for your first fish. This is Amy Adams. She works in our fisheries division. She, she came to us having never caught a fish, so we had to fix that. And we got her out and she caught a largemouth bass. And as a recruitment story, she's gone on to kill turkeys and deer this year. So she's been, uh, and I also wanted to mention her because she's a great asset to us because she prepares all the certificates that we mail out from our office. So, so the, the oldest program we have is the state record fish program. This started in the probably in the 40s. Ed's not here to ask those questions anymore. When did the state record fish start? Probably when the agency started in the 40s. The, the earliest record we have is this 1950, or 1955 uh, smallmouth bass from Del Hollow. And th this program recognizes fish by weight and they have to be certified scales by certified by the Department of Ag and we have to have a, a biologist on site to identify that the fish is indeed that species which gets to be hard for people sometimes. We've had many, uh, uh, you know, a smallmouth bass brought in as the state record rock bass, for example. But so we need to see those fish. Uh, we currently have 74 species that we track and nine of them happen to be all tackle world records. So we're doing pretty well on that front. And we have the, the class B is for any fish that are caught other than rod and reel. And that would include archery, spear fishing, commercial fishing, just everything else that's not standard class A rod and reel that would go to the alt tackle records. And we recognize 35 species for that. And we've had a lot of those records broken recently with the uh, enthusiasm around archery fishing. Here's just some of the, I'll say latest ones. These are probably, some of these are getting to be five years old. That one in the lower what, right corner, that's Emma. She's got a, almost a five pound silver red horse that she caught. And uh, that was one of the latest state record fish that were that was over on the Halston or South Halston, I'm not sure which. Um, so the program I want to really spend a little more time on is our angler recognition program. I mean, the, there's a lot of interest in state record fish, but not everybody can catch a state record fish. You just don't live long enough or don't fish enough to encounter one. Uh, but everybody, I think, can catch a, a, a tarp fish or a trophy sized fish. So that's what this program is about. We started in 2003. We recognize people, you, know, you get a certificate if you catch a trophy sized fish. And we also recognize you on the website. There's actually a database that anybody can see online to look up all the, uh, the tarp fish that are caught and where they were caught. So it's identifying trophy waters to us. That, that was one of the, you know, the, it's a program for the anglers, but we get something out of it too in understanding where our better fisheries are and places we should be promoting for good fishing. This uses lengths instead of weight because it's just easier for everybody. Can, anybody can take a picture of a, of a tape measure and a fish and we can be pretty sure that it's over the minimum length that it needs to be. And it also allows for catch and release that way. Uh, we currently have 25 fish species in the program. That number changed over the years. We probably added three species since we started. Uh, and you know, when you look at R3, this is, in my opinion, a strong retention program because it motivates people to stay in the game and try to get that next species or, or get more, get, get a higher level in the program. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So how do you qualify? Okay, the fish has to be over the, the, the right size, has to be caught by a rod or cane pole got to be licensed. We do check to make sure people have licenses. Uh, and their application has to be sent to us within 90 days. And there is a processing fee, $5. That's not, we're not making money on this program, but we, last time we did the math, we think we're covering all our ink and copyright uh, costs for the images that we use on these certificates. And uh, this is just an example of somebody taking the length of a fish and sending it in. This is actually a good example. You should see all the ways people can run a a ruler across the fish, but uh, anyway, that, there's, a, there's a tarp white crappie for you. 
So we got the rules. This is one of the original brochures, but you can look online and you can print out the form. There's a shorter version of this form printed in the fishing guides, easily accessible to everyone to apply. And this is probably the best image I have. If you can't read, hopefully you can read some of those numbers there. When we looked at sizes for these fish to be trophy, we based it on what, you know, we, we see a lot of fish. So we based it on what we thought would be a, kind of a hard fish to catch. Some of them are, turned out to be easier than others. And that's okay. I don't think every fish should be impossible to get. So it really allows people to get, a, you know, get one here and there, some easy ones and then some harder ones. The other neat thing about this is if you get interested in getting more different species, you have to travel around a bit to really to find the places where you can get bigger fish to do it. So it should make the sport more interesting to you if that's what you're doing. So here's an example of a certificate, and you all have certificates in front of you there. I tried to make the species per, uh, appropriate to the individual, and you can try to figure out how that is. But I was really disappointed that James Stroud isn't here because I assigned him the freshwater drum because he's a drummer. So that, that was the easiest one. He's not here. Oh, well. But anyway, those are examples of the certificates, and they're dated from March when we were going to have this meeting uh, before this uh, topic was canceled. But. Anyway, here's the, here are some stats on the TARP program. We've issued sev over 7,000 of these certificates since 2003. Uh, anglers have been reported to be 2 to 91 years old. 15% of them are non-residents. It's, uh, it's a pretty neat uh, add-on to a, a, maybe a guided fishing trip to catch a trophy fish and then, and then get this certificate before you go home or on your way out. We actually shipped one to Australia this year. That was kind of fun. The other country was Canada that we've worked with, and, uh, and we had someone from the Virgin Islands was the U.S. territory. Uh, we've had a fish in every species category, so the, at least the numbers aren't too high. Uh, and nearly 75% of them have come from just 20 water bodies in the state. 65% of the fish are released, and eight species account for 70% of the certificates. So let's, I have kind of a breakdown of that here. So this table shows you the eight species that are the most commonly reported. And if you get out to that water body of largest catch, that's just the place where the biggest one was caught ever. And there's a couple of ties there. But that far right cat, uh, column is probably the most interesting. Where do you get the most trophy fish for those species? And there's the list. Uh, we've got Dale Hall, Chickamauga, Caney Fork, Chickamauga, Chickamauga. Region 3 looks pretty good. Uh, it's, it's good, good fishing around there. A lot of that has to do with uh, some guides that really promote the program for us. So we might see a little more, uh, more certificates than we would otherwise in other places. But anyway, so that's the kind of information we can get from this. Uh, the brook trout on the Caney Fork River is kind of an anomaly. When we started this program, brook trout, we didn't have brook trout in our hatcheries. So it was only wild brook trout were the species of, you know, so we thought a 10 inch brook trout was gonna be a really big deal for people. Well, then we started stocking them, and we're stocking them at like 9 or 10 inches. So that's a pretty easy one to get. But you have to go to one of the tailwaters where we're stocking brook trout to get one. So if you're, it's, it got easier than it maybe, maybe we thought it would be. But anyway, so that's, uh, those were the places, or the, the fish. And these are the top 20 places just in rank order of number of certificates that have come in. So you got Chick, Watts Bar, Nickajack, Kenny Fork. Region 3 on the top there, and Kentucky Lake's always strong, and then back to Dale Hollow. So, and private ponds are in there. I'm sure a lot of big bluegill and uh, even bass are coming out of private ponds. So that's not the end of the tarps. Uh, it, once people start doing this, they want to do more of it. So we've had to create four levels of master angler based on the number, number of certificates that they have and species, and it's not driven by the biggest fish. So the Master Angler 1 is for people that submit any five trophy fish. So if you get five certificates, they could all be smallmouth bass. You can be a Master Angler 1. We've got what, close to 300 people that have done that. Then we have the ang Master Angler 2. You have, you have to demonstrate that you've caught five different fish that meet the qualifications. And we've got 125 that have done that. You get a patch. When, with, that's what that thing in the lower right corner is, a little patch that comes with your certificate. And we list the names of the species that you caught on your certificate. We don't just say five fish. And then here's an example of Master Angler 3. 
we, we, we print the actual images of the 10 different fish that you submitted on the, on the certificate, and we've got 32 to do that. They also get a, a, a sponsored pro package from Bass Pro and, a, and another patch. And then we had to come up with another one because they keep this. Uh, Eric Meyer was one of the early pioneers of getting, you know, being really aggressive in this program. So we ended up putting all the all the fish on the certificate, a different patch, and a trophy. Uh, you know, and I don't know what's next for for the program. It, it will change over time. We we're, we're kind of open to that, but we're really sensitive to not messing with it too much because people that are in the program really want to know that we are you know kind of staying true to our guidelines they don't want us to make it easier necessarily midstream after they did the work to get where they were and they also want to make sure that we're reviewing these in in-house to make sure that the species are correct and everything's on the up and up so we we, we do go do that diligence to have uh, a good program that, that they're you know, proud to be in yes Here's just a few pictures of some, uh, the other neat thing is we get a lot of pictures this way and as cameras are getting better, we're getting better pictures, but these are just a few, few images that the people have sent in their, you got young, you got younger kids, you got older people. Uh, we even got former commissioners now. I, I'm sure Commissioner Swan would like to be here to tell you all about this fish, but I can only share this picture today, but it is a, it is a really nice catfish o over. <laughs> so it's a great, great photograph too. <laughs> so, uh, the lake sturgeon is, uh, this isn't really an angler participation, uh, th this is more for the biologists. So we stock, we've stocked hundreds of thousands of sturgeon in the Cumberland and Tennessee rivers, and they're really hard to just go out and sample and, and catch. So we want to know all about them if any fisherman ever catches them, and they do get caught by fishermen because they take worms and pretty simple baits, and they congregate below dams where people are fishing. So we set up this uh, appreciation certificate that shows the sturgeon. So if you catch one you, and you know about the program, you can let us know where you caught it. We'll ask you all about your experience, you know, what, how big do you think the fish was, what you used for bait, where were you, and then we'll send you this certificate that it's free. And we've issued over 600 of these certificates now. So the, the goal of the sturgeon, the lake sturgeon program is to reintroduce this species that's been extirpated. We'd like to see this fish reproducing naturally in the state and eventually have an open fishing season regulated in some way, but to encourage some harvest of these fish. We're a long way from that, but we're a lot further along than we were prior to year 2000. So this program has been pretty neat to help us know that fishermen are engaging in, in, this, in this fish and should be getting people excited about the thought of lake sturgeon recovery. So with that, I think that's all I have on the on the recognition programs, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Frank. Commissioner Sanders. Frank, it's clear you need to come to uh, Chickamauga to catch fish, is what I'm seeing, right? Yeah. Uh, Eric passed away a couple of years ago and was a great guy, but he was so proud of those master anglers, one, two, three, and four. He would come to my radio show quite a bit and just bragged about the program he said that was the best thing that we ever did and uh, so it's it was great to see his name pop up there and yeah. uh and you know he set many records but he was really proud of the tarp program so yeah thanks for pointing that out he was, must have been a great guy because i know that he also worked with other fishermen that were trying to get to their levels and shared what he knew so that's a true sportsman there anyone else commissioner gardner yeah, Frank, I was looking on the uh, app and I was trying to find the length requirements. Is that going to be available for the app? If, it, if it's available now, how do you find it? And if it's, it's available. not, is it something we could maybe add to the tackle box uh, it, That's certainly possible. I know it's available through the website, but that's not the app, I understand. So that's, it's doable. I, I don't know. Uh, I, can, I can see if we can get that added I to know the me, app. If, if I was... You know, when I fish regularly, when I catch a real good fish, I, it'd be nice to know that, oh, man, I'll, let's check the app, see if it makes yeah. the cut. Yeah, on, that would you be know, when you pretty easy to add, I would think. Yeah. Yeah, thank All you. right, thanks. Michael, do you want to comment on that? I know Jennifer doesn't have a microphone up there, I don't think. So. <laughs> oh, it's there. Oh, sorry. So walk us through here. I'm on the app. You go to fish. Okay. 
right. Excuse me, Jennifer, but what else would be under everything fishing that is no longer there? The whole page of everything. The, the, the whole. It's the, uh, it's the uh, page that's CWA slash fishing. That's what pulls up. So that's literally gotcha. to the website with the laundry list of fishing resources. We'll get right. that. I don't know what happened. Any other questions for Frank? Any comment from the public? Thank you, Frank. And I, I, I do want to, you know, publicly thank a lot. A lot of guides do this, um, especially I assume in Commissioner Sanders' area over there. But they'll, they'll put their pictures on social media and, and do this for the anglers. And it's a, it's a real benefit for us that they're doing this. And I, I appreciate appreciate those uh, helping promote it. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. <coughs> Next, I'll call on our Wildlife and Forestry Division Chief. Joe Benedict. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Commissioners. As we know, uh, the world changed drastically in the last three months, and I'm here today to talk about a change that we need to make based on the COVID-19 restrictions that we have. Uh, and this is in regarding uh, the handheld drawings that we hold for both sandhill crane tags or permits and waterfowl, waterfowl blinds. I'll provide just a little bit of background uh, about the issue. I think most of us know about COVID. If you don't know, um, it's in the news. Um, I'll talk a little bit about Sandhill Crane tag drawing procedures for this year. Um, it's informational only. There's no change required by the commission, no action required. Uh, the changes we're proposing to make um, are, are all within the, the current rule language. Um, we will, um, at the pleasure of the chair, open the, an emergency rule hearing uh, to change the procedures for the duck blind drawing. Um, and when I go through that, uh, when we get to there, we will, um, we will, I'll talk about uh, how the drawing is going to happen and then we'll actually look at the rule language and then the commission will take action on that. So I'll get to that slide here in a minute. But first, uh, let me just read this background slide. You'll see this uh, twice. Uh, I just want to make sure that members of the public that might watch this video later uh, hear this exactly as our attorneys have written it. It's the preamble uh, to the rule change. Due to the outbreak of COVID-19 and Governor Lee's Executive Order Number 38, the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency must change its historic procedure for conducting in-person drawings for permanent duck blinds and sandhill crane tags. These drawings bring large crowds, often over 1,000 individuals. To prevent a potential risk to the public health and safety, the agency needs to change the drawing procedures for 2020. So I'll just go through the, the process that we're planning to use for Sandhill Crane Tags this year. Uh, most of you know that we do a handheld drawing uh, in, in Southeast Tennessee, and then we follow that with a, with a statewide uh, computerized drawing. Uh, we plan this year to do one um, computerized drawing for all the tags throughout the entire state. So this is a pretty significant change. Uh, historically, we've had tags valid statewide and then tags valid only in the crane zone. Uh, we're proposing to put them all into one, one drawing. The application period that our licensing folks have worked with a vendor to, um, to allow is September 2nd through the 23rd. Uh, that's an online application. Uh, 1,350 hunters would be randomly selected. Each hunter would be issued two tags, and that will issue all 2,700 tags that we have to issue. Again, all tags are valid statewide, and this is a new thing. Um, we will be We'll be issuing a priority point to unsuccessful applicants. That's something that, that many of our, our hunters have asked for uh, because we've had two separate drawings in the past. Uh, one was a handheld. There were some difficulties with, with trying to do that. But because all the tags are in one draw, um, we're confident we can issue priority points um, for this year. Those will only be valid um, in future drawings that are online. So I'll pause to see if there's any questions about the crane drawing process for this year. I'll pause for the chairman. All right. <clears throat> this is a rulemaking hearing before the Tennessee Fish and Wildlife Commission to consider adding an emergency rule to amend rule chapter 1660-01-08, which deals with rules and regulation regulations governing hunts. My name is Kurt Holbert, and I will conduct the hearing. Go ahead. Forgive the duplication. Let me just read the background. Due to the 
outbreak of COVID-19 and Governor Lee's Executive Order 38, the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency must change its historic procedure of conducting in-person drawing for permanent duck blinds. These drawings bring large crowds of duck hunters, often over 1,000 individuals. To prevent a potential risk to public health and safety, the agency needs to change the procedures for drawing permanent duck blinds. So I'll go through the preferred um, draw system that we, uh, we plan to do this year pending the rule change. Um, let me just say, state, uh, start by stating that the agency has worked very hard to try to minimize the changes that will be required because of COVID-19. Um, obviously, moving to a computerized draw is a big change, but we tried to mimic as much of the process as we could. Um, the second piece is we, we worked with our license vendor, Brandt, who I know they're watching online. They were part of the celebration last night. Um, they, they, um, they've answered tons of questions uh, from our staff, licensing and permitting. Uh, my staff, uh, law enforcement, others uh, have worked hard to, f to figure out the best system. What we don't want to do is have a computerized uh, drawing that crashes the system or that somehow fails, right? So. We, 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 we had two, two sort of uh, sidebars. One is we wanted to make it as similar to the current process or the previous process as possible. But on the other side, we wanted to use existing programming. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things that, that folks could throw out as, ide as ideas. Many of our staff did that. When you go into the computerized system to, to write code, it takes a lot of time to write it um, and then test the code, uh, which you know, anytime you change a computerized code, um, there could be an error. So we were trying to blend and balance um, existing code with the, the historical process to ensure a very good draw without without a failure of the system. So with that as a background, uh, these computerized drawings will be held uh, individually for each wildlife management area. Hunters may only apply for one wildlife management area. Just like the handheld draw, you have to pick where you went. It's the same thing. You have to pick one WMA to apply for. Uh, there's no change to the uh, current license and permit requirements. Um, if you apply for a quota hunt for deer or turkeys, there's an option to pay a fee and not have a license. We, we didn't go with that. Again, we're trying to maintain the current process as best we could. Uh, the application period would be July 2nd through July 26th, 2020. Um, that's a little over three weeks uh, for folks to go on and apply. You could either apply as an individual or as a party. The, the maximum party size would be eight. Uh, that's the number of folks that would be allowed in a blind at any time based on the current rule. Uh, Sign-ons may not be added later and so your party would be defined on the application. Whoever's on the application that's drawn, a successful applicant, uh, those are the folks that would be issued the permit. Applicants can prioritize up to 24 blind locations. Um, this is different than the handheld drawing where you could prioritize all the blinds, right? Old Hickory has, I believe, 88. You could, you could have a list of, of 88 priorities and during the draw you would be able to figure out which one you wanted. Um, the computer system that we have, that Brant has, the system that Brant uses in every other state that they, that they um, uh, run the license system, 24 is the maximum that they have. And so we didn't want them to go write some new code for this, again, and have a crash to the system. So uh, the, if you apply for a deer or turkey quota permit, you have 24 choices. So this, this mirrors the current, the other quota system that we have. Uh, the computer would randomly select applicants after the application period is over. It will issue the blinds in preferred order. So the first person drawn would get their first preferred blind. The second person, you know, they would go through the list um, and, uh, and give them the, their next preferred blind if it's, if it's available. Uh, no priority points are issued or used. Um, there, there is a computerized draw for uh, waterfowl quota hunts. And these are three-day hunts, two- or three-day hunts at Pagoda, Thorny Cypress, and those places. We do issue priority points for those. Uh, they will not, uh, we will not intermix the two systems because they're completely different. So again, in keeping with um, uh, as much of the, the tradition as we can, uh, we expect the results of the drawing to be available by August 1st. Uh, successful applicants would be issued an electronic blind permit with name, address, TWRA ID number, and then the blind number. So that's their, that's their blind identification card. Uh, blind construction deadline, again, remains unchanged. Uh, blinds have to be built that meet the minimum standards by the fourth Monday in October. Um, if the blind doesn't meet your, the standard or if, if no blind is attempted to be built uh, by that date, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the permit will be canceled, and then canceled blinds, blind sites become temporary hunt locations. So we'll, we'll have a stake out there 
that folks could go to and hunt. Um, and we'll provide a list of those uh, in early November after the drawing. And after the, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, the blind construction deadline. So I'll move into the emergency rule language. And uh, you, you, commissioners, you should have received this uh, on your iPad or, or you may have it in front of you. I won't read the, f the full language. What I want to do is just share the changes uh, from, from last year uh, or from, yeah, from the previous rule. Um, so we've added in, in paragraph A here, you'll, you'll see the language that says um, permanent blind sites may be allocated by a handheld draw, and we've added a computerized drawing or any other drawing method deemed appropriate by the agency. So we've just added the flexibility uh, required to do this computerized drawing. Um, sorry. The, uh, so we removed language in B that requires folks to uh, be at the blind draw in person. Previously, you had to be there, obviously, on that first Saturday in August. We've removed that language. Um, paragraph C, uh, functionally, is not a change. You can, you can still only apply one time. Uh, on one application. If, if you apply as a party leader and then on a party of another person, the computer will find you and take you off of the, uh, the duplicate application. So you can only put in once. Um, again, no change uh, to the required license and permits. They're slightly different for real foot uh, from the other areas that we have. And then operationally, this is not a change. Um, the previous language said that permits for blinds will be issued at the drawing. This says after the drawing, there, there'll be nobody here except the licensed folks in the office. So this is a slight change, but functionally, it, it won't be a change. And again, this is where the, uh, the construction of the blind uh, is referenced in a different rule there. So again, not a change. And again, no change. It's illegal to buy, sell, uh, barter, loan, transfer, uh, any blind uh, or blind card. No change to that. <clears throat> and then finally, the last slide, uh, if you look at the bottom there, this paragraph 3G uh, is a portion of this rule uh, that's before you today. Uh, that pertains to the waterfowl quota hunt drawings. Those are those three, two or three day hunts at Bogota and Thorny Cyprus. Um, and this um, also adds the ability to do uh, for vacant hunts. For those hunts, when you're issued the quota permit, you have to return a notice of intent. Uh, if you can't go because you have a wedding on that weekend, you can turn the permit back in. And so we have vacant drawings uh, for those hunts that, that folks aren't gonna go on. Typically those are handheld drawings um, in the week or two before those hunts. And so we want to, again, just provide additional flexibility. We're not sure how we're going to do those yet, um, but this language will mirror um, the language that we have added before um, where you can, uh, we could do a handheld computer or a, a, another uh, drawing method that we, we deem it appropriate. Mr. Chairman, that concludes the rule recommendation. All right, thank you, Joe. I'm going to go ahead and get a, a motion in a second uh, before we start discussion on it. So I hear a motion for passage. I have a motion from Commissioner Tommy Woods, a second from Commissioner Box. Um, the motion will be to pass rule number 1660-01-08-05, the emergency rule. Is there any questions from commission? Commissioner Wright. Uh, Joe, on section E in the emergency rule, um, language all decoy and other hunt associated items must be removed at the end of each day is that for just temporary blind sites or the all blind permit temporary blind sites okay, good <clears throat> commissioner granberry joe i know it's a really small percentage but how do you accommodate somebody who doesn't have access to a computer uh, folks can <clears throat> Excuse me, folks can make application at any licensed agent uh, so they can go into a sporting goods store and, and they'll walk them through the application process. Okay, great, thank you. Any other comments from any commissioners? Any comment from the public? I do have a question. Will you, will you step to the microphone so people online can hear you? 
I had to find the microphone, but that's, that's, they moved it. Hey, good morning. I'm Will Burton from my Paris, Tennessee. I just wanted to make sure that I understood. So each individual, whether they apply as an individual or a party, will only have one application in the withdrawal. Correct. So if you have a party of eight, you only have one chance at getting a black. Correct. Instead of having eight chances. Correct. We, we worked through that with Brant to try to figure out if we could do that. It would be such a big change to the system that we were afraid that we would, we would cause a failure. Yeah. Instead of part of being put in eight times, it just be Correct. Right. Correct. So make Thank you, Will. Thank you. Any other comment from the public? No other comments? All in favor of emergency rule 1660-01-08-05, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, like sign. Motion carry. All right. Next, I'm going to call on... Chuck Yost, our CWD coordinator in Wildlife Division. Good morning, commissioners. Pardon me if I seem a bit paranoid. One of my colleagues just told me I look very comfy today. And I really don't know how to take that, so uh, pardon me for that. Uh, one other thing uh, I wanted to say, uh, express my gratitude for the honor of being able to help host last night's event for Director Carter. That was great, so thanks for that opportunity to the directors and the commission, so thank you. Moving forward, I'm here today to uh, provide a a quick update on CWD and um, <clears throat> I wanted to start start with with this this is a quote or a, an excerpt taken right out of a, a recent survey that uh, we partnered with the University of Tennessee to conduct this is uh, it's it says resident survey but you you might as well take it as a landowner survey in in unit CWD and I wanted to share this as a as a compliment to the commission the agency um, and TWA staff at just how how good of a job we're doing considering uh, the unbelievable challenge that we have with chronic wasting disease in Tennessee but anyway it, it they conducted this survey recently and this was just following the end of this last deer season so this is really hot off the press but it says that, that, that at the, that survey that uh, they expressed a great deal of trust and confidence in TWA for managing CWD, and 67% of those respondents somewhat or strongly agree that, that we will take the appropriate actions uh, to manage it and that uh, we have an appropriate plan for CWD in Tennessee. And I just wanted to, to share that as a, as a compliment and just thanks so much for, for your support and for everyone's support because it literally takes everyone to be successful in this and and we're fully committed and uh, just wanted to to share that as a as a bit of good news moving on to some of the some of the planning we're, we're currently doing you know disposal is a big issue with chronic waste and disease especially in Tennessee and we're in the process of final, finalizing the procurement of the large-scale incinerator and uh, the state process for that uh, is to be completed in about two weeks so around july 15th is our expectation for that once once that is done uh, we'll be able to tell fayette county exactly what unit is coming their way and they will then be able to start site prep and to uh, go through the the permitting actions that they need to take with tdec and so, so again, this year disposal is a big component of our planning and, and we're actively uh, or continuing our conversations with TDEC and the Department of Agriculture on disposal uh, for this upcoming deer season. 
So that's, that's been a major focus. Uh, there's, there's also a lot of interest in our targeted, the targeted removal component of our program, and we continue to plan for these efforts. Uh, these, these will traditionally occur at the end of deer season. And just a, a reminder of, of, of what this is, if you if you'll look at the map there, those, uh, those locations, uh, they're mainly in red. Like if you focus on uh, the farthest one to the east, you've got Chester County there. And so you've got that one red positive location in Chester County. We commonly refer to those as sparks. So that's an area where, as far as we know, uh, it's isolated area of CWD that, that spread there. And ideally, we could, we could eliminate that. Um, if there's infected deer there, we could eliminate those infected deer, keep the disease from permanently establishing there like, unfortunately, it, it already exists in, in Fayette and Hardeman County. Once, once CWD becomes as, as prevalent as it is in Fayette and Hardeman, the environment starts to uh, play a role in disease transmission. And it's a, it's a much more challenging situation. However, in those low prevalence counties like Chester, there's an opportunity to, to kind of snuff out the disease there. And target removal creates an opportunity for that. Now what that, more specifically what that is, is that with landowner permission, um, the, the agency can partner with landowners and, and then uh, we, we partner with USDA Wildlife Services who can harvest deer there in addition to what's taken by hunters through typical hunter harvest. So, so um, what we learned last year is that we, we, we can develop that option, and we did, and we went through the policy development for that. Uh, but, but as we concluded those efforts, the season uh, that we had, we had framed up for that ended in March, and and we just didn't, we weren't, we weren't able to get landowner buy-in or permission uh, during that time before that short window closed. So I'm gonna talk about some of the lessons learned. And, and one of them is, is that landowner buy-in is a challenge. However, it's one that I'm optimistic about us uh, overcoming. And, I, and I'll take just a minute to, to explain what's on the screen here. So this is, this is some more uh, survey work that we've done with uh, regarding landowners and hunters. So what you have here is the relative acceptability of targeted removal. And just to keep things simple, just look at the, just look at the, the column on the, f the, the farthest to the right because that's your landowners. That was targeted at landowners. And the more green there is the less, less acceptable they are for targeted removal. The more green, the more acceptable it is to them. So, so the outcome's pretty good. So what you have there, you basically have uh, 30 plus 30, 60, uh, and then, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, around 60% are some, somewhat acceptable, or, or accept, or they're, they're open to this uh, option in partnering with the agency. And then 27% were kind of indifferent. So the news, the news is pretty good through those surveys. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of openness uh, to this option. So, so our plan is, is to capitalize on that, work closer with those landowners, and start recruitment early and cast a wider net than we did last year. And then, and then you know, take the lessons learned from our messaging, improve our messaging. In our, in our communications with those, those landowners that could make such a, a big difference uh, if they align with the agency. So, so anyway, the plan is, is to, to implement those lessons learned regarding targeted removal. Uh, start small with a small group of influential landowners and uh, earn their trust and, and demonstrate success through them and then build off those. And in and, and doing that and, and making those connections, you know, our wildlife officers and our local field staff in this area uh, can help us make some connections. So there's, there's one avenue there, uh, have a high, high confidence in that likelihood. And then also the, the Wildlife Federation has is, is, uh, been a continual partner 
and they will, I know, support us in, in making these connections and building these relationships. And then Farm Bureau has even offered to help us uh, locate landowners in those areas that could help. So another lesson learned is it's going to, this is, this is a whole other monumental effort by the agency. It's going to require additional staff and you guys have supported uh, the plans for those additional staff. So uh, that was one of the other lessons learned that you guys are helping us overcome. One, uh, another, another management component or option that we have is that, that landowners in Hardeman and Fayette counties and in those spark areas, again, can get a, what we call a control permit. Uh, a lot of folks uh, are familiar with depredation permits and this, this is another, another flavor of a control permit. So in those counties, landowners can get these permits to, to harvest deer outside of uh, deer season or take, take deer outside of deer season to help with these efforts. These, the biggest uh, payoff for this option will be in those high prevalence counties of Fayette and Hardeman. And uh, the, the Wildlife Federation already has an, an active group of landowners that are really interested in doing more. And, uh, and the, uh, one of our goals is, is to, to work closer with the Federation and that group, especially with this uh, control permit option. And uh, as, as far as acceptability of these things, this is some, some more information here as far as acceptability. And again, I'll just steer you to look to the column to the far, farthest to the right and remember the, the less red or the more red, the more resistant they're gonna be, the more green the more acceptable they are. And there's a, there's a good degree of acceptability for this option as well. So I'm optimistic about these management tools or this management tool as well as targeted removal. And just, just for fun, uh, go ahead and look at those two left columns as well because that's your hunters. We did a preseason uh, survey and a postseason survey and just to see their their openness to this option and there's good acceptability from those hunters as well. So the, the hunters, the landowners are open to it and, uh, and interested. So that is a great scenario considering the, the, the real important work that we have to do together in the future to be successful at uh, properly managing CWD. So uh, just a few other big, big ticket things that have been occurring. There's been a lot of focus on uh, future budgeting for CWD. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a new and very large um, obligation that the agency has. So we've put a lot of efforts into planning for the future as far as budgeting. And then, you know, deer season's not that far away and the good service testing that we provided to hunters last deer season uh, we're going to do that again, obviously, and we're planning for that. That's a huge effort, and we want to be quicker, and, uh, and, but we want to continue uh, doing a great job with that. So a lot of planning going into that. One little detail example that I'll give you regarding that service testing is that, um, you know, we've added three counties to unit CWD, so that means we need no more uh, drop-off locations in those counties for hunters to get their deer tested. And that means needing more freezers and we're not able to purchase freezers. Freezers aren't available for purchase because there's a high demand for freezers because of something related to COVID. I'm not sure what it is, but you just, that just gives you an idea of uh, some of the things that we're focused on and some of the challenges that we're facing uh, with that. But we'll, we'll overcome that and uh, just wanted to mention that. Just for your information and too, if you can pull a string and help us find uh, freezers for sale, I'm wide open to that as well. So uh, la lastly, and this is, this is something I'm really proud of uh, for, the, for the team that's been focused on CWD, is, is you know, it's, it's starting to, in October, the annual CAFL conference occurs, Southeastern Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. And, you know, what, 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 we've, what we've done in Tennessee in, in, in managing this, uh, this uh, monumental challenge is being noticed across the country. And, and at that, um, that annual conference that they have soon, we're gonna be, we're gonna be offering presentations uh, regarding the challenges that we've had with manpower, disposal, service testing, and communications, which are you know, some of your biggest pieces to management. And I, I, I wanted to share that as a compliment to staff that 
you know, there's an example of where what's been accomplished uh, with your all support here in Tennessee is going to have a r ripple effect and help others across the nation in dealing with this challenge, um, whether they have it yet or not. So anyway, I wanted to share that as just a compliment to staff and grateful for their, uh, for their support. With that, I'll be glad to entertain any questions. Thank you, Chuck. It's hard not to call him scrumpy. Um, one question I have is the new hires that you mentioned, when will those, will those be able to take place before archery season and um, get those in place or what's the timeline you're looking at on that? I'm not sure. I'd, I'd have to defer to others. Uh, my understanding is, is that um, when, 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 we, when we create the, the new budget in just a few weeks, they'll be in, included in them. But as far as the timing of when those will be announced in field, I'm just unsure. Okay. Director Wilson, you... That's a good question. We don't have an answer for it right now. We'll just know that we'll be plugging away and trying to get those as soon as we can. Okay. Definitely important hires that we need to, to get through the process. And I know there's a process um, through the state right now, especially with the, the freezing hire, but we these are definitely essential and we need them to, to help us stop the spread to the rest of the state, CWD. I saw several hands go up. Commissioner Gardner. Thank you, Chairman. Um, appreciate the presentation, Chuck, and I appreciate all your teams doing, you, you and your team and the agency as a whole. It's, uh, it's been impressive. Uh, the control permits is what I have questions about. Um, what are we doing with the carcasses? And are we testing those when you give a control permit or even depredation? Because I know some of those are getting out, and it seems – I've heard through the grapevine, through some young folks that, uh, that are participating with a depredation for a farmer, uh, that, that they're not all getting tested and, and uh, maybe a lack of control over carcass disposal. And I was wondering if you could elaborate. Yeah, without, without uh, getting too deep into this, the, whenever, whenever a, uh, a landowner receives a uh, control permit for CWD management. The uh, the the wildlife officer that issues that designates a worthy recipient uh, for for the for the animals, and it that worthy recipient is responsible for uh, the disposal. And and the really really the only um, involvement that we would have at that point is just recommending to those landowners best practices for disposal. In regards to testing those animals, we're, we are uh, looking at testing for those permits on a case-by-case -case basis. The priorities are, the, the, are those spark areas. However, the, in, the, in, the, in the areas where, uh, where CWD is most concentrated, we're not, we're not adding that additional responsibility to, additional responsibility to, the, to the permittee because uh, the, not that they're not important, but the value or significance of those uh, samples uh, are not near the ones in the spark areas and just trying to use resources as efficiently as we can. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Commissioner Ripley. I agree uh, with Commissioner, Commissioner Gardner in, in uh, thanking you for, for what you're doing on this. With regard to the landowner buy-in part of it, how are we approaching these people? Do they get a letter from us? Do we, does someone knock on their door? What, how, how are we going about approaching them? Well, of course, what I'm, what I'm describing is to come. So um, I'm not really referencing what we've done in the past. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how, uh, what the details will be of the approach. I'm going to work with our uh, communications division to, to uh, take the lessons learned from last year and try to be as, as thoughtful and successful as we can be. But it's going to be multifaceted. Uh, the, I think the, the prime or the initial interactions will likely be in person and then maybe some follow-up um, materials and sort but not exactly sure yet but but we'll we'll be thoughtful and we'll keep you posted okay. thank you commissioner 
Rat. No, just had a couple of questions for you, Chuck. If you don't mind, I'll just ask them one at a time. But again, thanks for the presentation. Great, um, great presentation. Great job managing this so far, and I appreciate your hard work. Um, my questions are around the incinerator. Um, we approved that in December. We had an emergency approval for it, and we did the right thing. Uh, we didn't have enough information, but we approved it so it would be ready for August of 2020. And I just wanted to ask some questions around the incinerator and its management. Um, one would be, when's the pro projected completion date mm -hmm. of that? Um, you can, I'll just do them one at a time. Go ahead. Yeah, so based on uh, the procurement ending or the, that us being finalized with that process in July 15th. Typically, if you ask a manufacturer, it's, it's going to be uh, construction and delivery and setup is about a six month process. So um, not, 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 not what we were hoping. However, it's, it's where we are. And uh, so, so the hope is, is to have that operational before deer season ends this next deer season. So around December or January? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, just, I had another question. I had spent some time with the officers of Hay uh, Hardeman and Fayette County just about the deer densities, especially in the, the most endemic areas or the highest prevalence. And it seems to be that they're not issuing many, they're not getting calls for depredation permits, which would indicate maybe their deer density is a lot lower there. So I have some questions about the geographic location of the of the incinerator, and I didn't know if y'all had done some harvest mapping. Maybe we don't have that data, but if we're gonna locate a shopping center, I'd probably put it right in the center of my area of my shoppers, and maybe Somerville is not the right spot. I don't know. I just didn't know if we'd had any, done any data about where the best spot for that is, and thinking, is that, the, is that central to our harvest? I know the harvest is down in those two counties significantly. Yeah. My, my response to that is is that it's it's good that uh, the the location is planned to be Fayette County because it's kind of the epicenter of of CWD in Tennessee. Um, Sorry, I'm peppering you. I got a couple more. So yeah, uh, I'll lump these together. Do we have a plan on uh, so let's say maintenance for these and what that costs over the years and who pays that? Fuel price, labor price, uh, what that'll cost to operate each one of these. I know we're just planning on one for now, but right. And and uh, backing up just a second to your previous question, so so not only is it is it good that it's located down there in that core area, but the you know the, it needs to be land, it needs to be located at a landfill, and there's only so many landfills in Tennessee. Period. So that's another logical reason why um, Fayette County was was this is the site. In, in regards to um, maintenance, oper uh, you know, and continuing operation of the incinerator long term, the the responsibility for that will be uh, with Fayette County. So um, I don't know if I, I'm going to defer to Director uh, Richardson on that. He knows more details about the arrangements than I do. been 100 percent accurate to to this point um, certainly I would offer one of the reasons why Fayette County is such an attractive place to put this incinerator is we have a very willing partner in Fayette County uh, that is going to take over operation of it uh, with his personnel now as far as the ongoing costs associated with maintenance or fuel costs or the cost of those employees those are all issues that that are still on the table uh, but I have made commitments to Fayette County that, that they will not get stuck with the bag. It will not be Fayette County that's paying for them. Um, they, they have been gracious enough to allow us to locate the incinerator on their property. They're providing a service to the state of Tennessee that they don't have to provide. Um, we all know that the state's in a financial crisis right now, and, and I expect that we will be asked by the state to step up in, the, in this regard. Now, that doesn't change the fact that as we continue to move forward with uh, the administration with our friends in the legislature we're going to continue to explain to them uh, the the problems associated with CWD and, and in particular this disposal issue and hopefully we're going to work towards uh, a system that um, perhaps the incinerator can be used to make a profit in in times when it's not um, 
being utilized for deer carcasses where that will offset some of the recurring costs. Uh, that's certainly something that ECD and others are, are helping Fayette County look at and developing a business plan for the incinerator in, in the off season, if you will. Uh, but, but right now, I think we as a wildlife agency, uh, deer carcasses, while we're, we're not in the disposal business, we are in the disease management business. And disposing of these carcasses is important uh, in every facet of what we're doing. Uh, because if we can't dispose of the carcasses, then people are not going to hunt. And if people don't hunt, we're not going to be able to um, handle the removal that we need. So uh, there's still not a lot of clarity, uh, but, but I think that there's commitment from Director Wilson and, and from a desire from the agency uh, to step up where we can uh, in, in uncertain times to make sure that, that we're moving in a positive direction and not stalling. <clears throat> Excellent. This last question about ash disposal. Will Fayette County landfill take our ash? The, the, and, and if you will, Commissioner, I'll just address that, and, and I think Chuck knows the answer. The new incinerator is a system design that will remove the ash in a vacuum manner straight into a 55-gallon lined drum, and that ash will then be put into the ordinary waste disposal stream that Fayette County has. It will not be disposed of on site at the Class Three landfill because that's not... Uh, it's considered special waste that's not allowed to go in a class three facility, but we're, the, that waste will be put into the ordinary waste stream that Fayette County is utilizing and it will be disposed of in, in that manner. So it won't be on site, but it will go into the ordinary waste stream that Fayette County is currently utilizing. Perfect. Um, I apologize for taking so much time. This is just bothering me. Uh, right now it's time to we'll answer. Be a, just a, a great steward of our finances and our, our resources and uh, I really, I really think um, I'd like to introduce a motion. It now's the time, but I really think that um, we should put this on hold for three or four months because we can't have it ready for 2020 season anyway. <coughs> and we'd have it installed in January, and then wait till August to process any deer, and and until we get some clarity on the items, you know. I, I think we ought to uh, postpone it, and so that's what my motion will be about. But the last thing I'd say is. We're going down a path where we could end up having five to ten of these across our state, and we just, I think all of us want to make sure that is this the right thing to do to buy ten incinerators across our state and have, maybe it is, it probably is, and I think a lot of work's been done. It's no one's fault it's not ready. COVID got in the way. We have a pandemic that's new to all of us, so I'd like to make a motion that we freeze. Before you make a motion. Yep, thank you. Just tell you the status of where we are right now in the incinerator. We have, uh, the, the bid has been put out. The bid has closed. We have received two bids. Um, I, I want you to understand that I believe we have we have a commitment out there, uh, and and I don't know the legal ramifications, uh, but but we are well down the track towards the procurement of the incinerator itself. And um, I was anticipating that your motion might be to to put that on hold or to remove that funding, and I just want you to be clear that I'm not sure what the implications are. Now that that's been out for bid, we've received the bids back. I don't know what type of commitment we we have to honor as far as, as moving forward in, in, on that regard. So I just offer that for informational purposes only. We're, we're at a point in time uh, where we, we may be, um, and, and in our conversations with TDEC and others, uh, we're very far down the track on, on at least this first incinerator and getting it online to see what type of volume it can handle. Um, and, and I just offer that for information purposes only. So we don't know if we're obligated by putting it out for bid to pay for it or the time frame. I, I'm, I am not a procurement expert in state <clears throat> process. I just know that that bid was, was completed, was put out, and that we have received responses. And uh, we will be uh, evaluating those bids over the next week to decide who will be awarded. Is where We are in the process now as far as how to change that or to, to halt that process. Uh, I'm unsure, uh, but again, the conversations we've had with the administration and with our partners, both at the Department of Agriculture and TDEC, they are fully expecting uh, us to put a, a, a large-scale incinerator online uh, it, within the time periods that, that have already been discussed. Bobby, do you have comments or direction for me? <clears throat> no, I agree with Chris. I think we're, we may be too far gone. Uh, at this point, I don't know what kind of legal obligation we may have, but I know the the, the bids were received uh, the other day, and 
uh, opened, and I think they're going to go through this process of reviewing. They may have some questions. They may have, I think there's some other processes where the, the uh, <clears throat> maybe the bidders who didn't get accepted, they get to question the, the ones who did or process. But it's, um, it's pretty far along right now. I'm not sure we can get out of it. Then I'll leave it as is, just with my stated discomfort. <laughs> I was going down this rabbit hole, and it's hard to turn around. So thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. Commissioner Ripley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chris, who, who all is involved in this? Is the governor's office involved? Uh, it, 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 obviously, the county government is involved. So who are all the players in this decision-making process? Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. It certainly, the governor's office has been involved in this uh, going back to, to when we originally found out that landfills were no longer going to take carcasses. Um, and specifically within the administration, um, Commissioner Salyers at TDEC and Commissioner Hatcher at the Department of Agriculture have been part of the, the, the inner circle team that, that has, has worked on the issue. Um, certainly Mayor Skip Taylor in Fayette County has been involved at, at a significant level as he's, he's graciously volunteered to allow his site to be the, the home of the incinerator and, and his employees to be the operators of the incinerator. Uh, so there's been a lot of discussion through that. There was a lot of discussion in the General Assembly. Um, there was a lot of commitments made by the agency after the commission took action in appropriating the money that we said we're going to build an incinerator. And, and we said at that time that we weren't sure whether it was a silver we didn't believe it was going to be the silver bullet that solved all of our disposal issues, but we all agreed that it was a step in the right direction and, it, and it's at least a method of disposal that, that we need to fully investigate through how, how much can it handle. And, and the, the unit that we've uh, procured is, is rated to burn uh, 500 pounds an hour, eight, eight hours a day, continuous operation with no burn, no cool down times. Uh, other than the vacuum seal once a day, or the vacuum of the ash once a day. So we, we feel that this is a very high capacity machine. We are going to have trans transportation issues to get carcasses to this central location. We're looking at how to utilize our small incinerators that don't reach 1800 degrees to reduce volume to further uh, make the, the large scale incinerator handle more. Uh, but but I, I have serious reservations if, if we were to to halt the progress that's been made or to uh, try to go a different path at this point. Uh, we're going to disappoint a lot of people and we're going to uh, not be honoring a lot of commitments that we made. Yeah, I, I guess that was my question. Is the expectation that we are going forward and Absolutely. we're going to have this in place in the next uh, relatively short period of time? Absolutely. Okay. And I would say that, that uh, Commissioner Wright is correct in, in that the COVID outbreak and, and the disruption that that had in a lot of state processes probably cost us the three months uh, uh, that that would have had this online at the beginning of deer season had we had we not had that outbreak. Okay, thank you, Commissioner McLaren. You, you, I think you still I, got a question. Yes, I've I've got uh, well one statement is uh, first off to Chris I would encourage them to make the process as rapidly as possible and and get it get it operational as soon as possible, and then my question would be to to Chuck, uh, have we considered uh, renting uh, refrigerated trailers like uh, tractor trailer trailers uh, instead of the freezers that we've installed in place that, that you could rent and use for a while and then uh, not have to keep them up through the through the summer months are, are you it is your question in regards to receiving heads from hunters to have the deer tested uh, you, you were mentioning um, buying more freezers. Oh, yeah. okay. And yeah. I, I wouldn't for sure if you were talking about storing the uh, carcasses off-site uh, before we brought them to the incinerator or if we were talking about the heads. I didn't know, but I just yeah. thought that might be an, an option to look into. Yeah, well, thank, thanks for that. And, and just to clear that up, yeah, when I was speaking on freezers before, it was only regarding those stations that hunters can drop the deer heads off in and and then we sample them and dispose of the remains. But, uh, but what, what I, I think uh, what I'm understanding you say is, is there, is there a possibility or have we thought about um, cold storage being a means of holding carcasses until disposed of, say, at the Fayette County landfill? But yes, sir, we have considered that and we have considered the, the leasing and, 
and thus far I've not acted on that. Thank you. Commissioner Jones. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I was actually going to second Commissioner Wright's uh, uh, motion uh, back, and it, it's, it's always bothered me just a little bit. We made this emergency appropriation in December, and I think my exact words were, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vote for this, but I like, I've got a lot of uh, answer, or I've got a lot of questions about capacity, does this meet the needs of the data that we talk about in our chronic wasting disease counties? Just basically a business model is what we're doing going to take care of the problem as it exists now. It, the operating cost was, has always been a question. Looking at it as a, you know, a, a potential in the future of having to create more of these different models and what the impact of this to the agency would be, uh, you know, from here on out. I've, I've just got, there's a lot of questions about the operation of this thing, the viability of this thing, the capacity of this thing that I'd like to have answered. So I don't, I don't think that I understood Commissioner Wright asking us to rescind the motion for the million dollars is just since it's not going to be in operation in time for the beginning of this deer season. Could we take a couple of months and look at a model and make sure that this is exactly what we want to convince, you know, so that we are comfortable making that decision moving forward? Uh, just, just, just answer some of those questions so that we can start planning for the long term. Uh, Mr. Jones, I'll certainly be, uh, I, I think we have. <clears throat> We have done a lot of work to this point and have a lot of information that we can provide to you as far as what we anticipate those operating costs to be, what we anticipate those capacities to be, and, and what we have historically seen as far as a need uh, for, for carcass disposal. Um, this is an ever-changing situation. Uh, I respectfully would request for us to continue down the process of uh, to, to get this online as, as soon as possible. I mean, in, in an optimistic world, uh, if we if everything goes well from here on we we could have this uh, machine operational to to consume some carcasses during this deer season uh, any delay at all is going to guarantee that that won't be possible and I, I think both from a uh, a commitment standpoint uh, to 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 our friends in the General Assembly and to the governor's office um, that delay may send um, a very bad message about what our uh, commitment to, to helping with this process is. Well, I think if you reach to the people that have bid on the equipment, you're going to find that there's a disruption in the supply chain for manufacturing equipment. And it's going to be, unless your RFP particular, you know, states that this equipment will be done in a certain amount of time, you're probably going to find that there's a disruption in supply chains anyway. We started out with a request for information from the vendors, and, and certainly the, the timing was critical right, and one of the questions that we asked. And um, the both of the vendors that have submitted bids, uh, each of them told us that they would be in a four to six month time frame uh, from the award of the bid to construction, completion, installation, and training on the machine. Uh, that's that's uh, as recent an information as, as the last 30 days. Uh, so I would hope that they had factored in any of those supply chain disruptions when they gave us that information. But but I, I, I certainly agree with you that that possibility exists. And rarely in a construction project or in a manufacturing does everything go perfectly. And so uh, I don't want to sit here and tell you I'm guaranteeing that this thing's going to be online in December. Uh, but that's certainly what I'm trying to accomplish. So looking at looking at the CWD instances that we have in the CWD counties right now, this may be a question for both of you, is the incinerator that we're putting in, are you confident that it will handle the capacity that we're generating right now? I, I would offer you this thought, and, and Chuck can correct me if I'm wrong. What we have to go on... Uh, there's a lot of carcasses that are ended up in, in different places, and we know that. But I believe that the incinerator can handle every carcass that we put in the CWD management site last year. Handle the capacity that we foresee this year? I would defer to, to Chuck and... and yeah, that, that I have complete confidence that we did our due diligence in specking out the right machine 
and um, yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, it, we the the we we set the bar high on what we needed, and and that's what we're getting bids on. So, I think you'll be comfortable with that. Okay. I got Commissioner Granberry first. I guess, uh, pardon the pun, uh, the million dollar question, we received two bids, what were our bids and how do we plan to utilize the excess money? I know Chris had talked about transportation boxes that would be utilized and additional staff. So uh, that was my question. And uh, I think to Commissioner Wright's point, if you proceed forward, which I think we absolutely should based on where we are in the process, it will certainly give us a lot of information to Commissioner Jones's point about a really good business model moving forward, God forbid, if it expands to seven or eight in need across the state. Commissioner address your first point. The, the, the bid closed uh, earlier this week, and, and we have not seen the bids. We don't know what the amount is yet. They're still being reviewed by the CPO as per the normal state process. Uh, we expect to hear back from CPO, I would assume, early next week to, to discuss the results of those bids. Um, there is absolutely, um, we, we kind of broke the million dollars up into two parts, and, and Fayette County was not real comfortable with the procurement process for such a, an expensive piece of equipment, so we as a state agency took on the, that procurement. The second phase of that, when we know the specific model that's going to be coming, is we're, we will do a grant contract to Fayette County for the site preparation. Um, and and, and we, depending on what the actual price of the incinerator is and what the price of that, that site prep is, is there in fact could be um, some dollars left over. Part of what we have uh, bid in the incinerator is multiple carts, if you will. If you saw the picture that Chuck had, there's a, a cart that the machine will actually lift up to load the incinerator automatically. And I think we, we put in the bid that we would like to have eight of those carts so that there is you know, always a place for a processor to, to come and deposit their material. And then we're asking the Fayette County employee to essentially just switch the carts, load it, and eight carts should be 500 pounds per cart eight times a day. Uh, so that's, that's kind of how we've designed the capacity to run there. Um, I would hope that there is money left over. And in this first year, um, my expectation would be to utilize whatever money is left in that budget to help Fayette County with the operations until we get a clear plan or a clear understanding of what they may be able to generate through, through business practices and, and what may be the long-term plans going forward uh, with our partners in the administration. Commissioner Ripley. Chris, is it unrealistic to think or to ask that by August we could have something in the form of a business plan, a draft business plan that will say, <clears throat> this is, you know, these are what various elements are going to cost. This is who's going to pay what. Um, and as part of that, I, I've always been uh, conscious that, you know, we're a state agency. We're providing money essentially to a single county, but with the idea that that county is going to service the counties around it. So, um, without an undue economic burden on those adjoining counties. Um, but if, if I would like to ask that by August, we have a, a, a draft plan that, that says this is what we project our fuel expense to be, our maintenance expense to be, <clears throat> our personnel requirements, so forth. So that, uh, because I share the commissioner's concerns that we, we've got to get a handle on that. Absolutely. I think that's very doable. Once we know the specific model that, that is coming, uh, we, can, we can then work directly with that manufacturer to understand what the fuel cost will look like. We can certainly work with Mayor Taylor to figure out what personnel uh, costs he anticipates. Um, and, and then I would expect that this is not going to be a, a free service uh, to, to processors. Processors have been accustomed to paying for at least some level of disposal fees when they were working with private landfill companies. Uh, so I would anticipate that there will be some revenue uh, associated with the disposal of these carcasses. And, and then, you know, as far as developing the secondary um, income, if you will, for the, for the off season, um, I'm not an incinerator expert or understand the demands that may be out there for incineration. 
Uh, we, we know that, that medical waste will not be an option for this, but, but there may in fact be other animal uh, incineration needs that, that could come that, that Fayette County can charge a fee for to offset any of those annual operating costs. So we certainly can work on that plan and, and we will have a lot more clarity on where we are in August. So, Mr. Chairman, I would just ask that, uh, that we might be able to expect that in August we would have a report uh, on those specifics as much as possible. Thank you. All right. Mr. Sanders. Chris, just one question. Medical waste is not an option, even though this incinerates at a higher temperature than medical waste? It has to do with the air quality permitting on the TDEC side and the design of the stack and some of the filters that have to go in would cause the uh, an incinerator that would be permitted to burn medical waste would be much more expensive than the one that we're procuring. Okay. Any other questions? Any comment from the public? Okay. Thank you, Chuck. You got it. Thanks. We're going to take about a 15 minute recess and we will come back and finish up the meeting.
I'm going to call on Ken Tarkington for our financial report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have a two-page report as usual. Uh, reporting through the month of May of 2020. Let me get my sheets out here. Uh, <clears throat> The boating fund at the top of the first sheet uh, is uh, approximately 160000 ahead at this point in time during the year uh, as opposed to the projection for the year. And our expenses are right at the 50% um, uh, level for the year. Uh, we only have one month to go, but there are several expenses that are accrued um, in June, which will bring that percentage up on expense. And, the wildlife fund in the middle of the page is uh, approximately $4.6 million ahead of the projection for the year. And the expense is about 65% uh, through May, 65% of the allotment. The wetlands acquisition fund has a balance of approximately $18.4 million. And the investments on the last page um, year to date for this fiscal year is at the 7.5 percent level. Uh, the uh, SPIF rate, which is the um, <clears throat> non-investment interest-bearing account that we have, is currently uh, paying uh, a half percent. Any uh -huh. questions or comments? Easy enough. All right. Thanks, Thanks Ken. Sir. All right, I'm going to call on our Outreach and Communications Chief, Jennifer W. <laughs> w for the win. I'd really like to hear it pronounced right, so I would know how to say it. So, Jennifer, would would you please pronounce it? Wisniewski. Wisniewski. Can you change your spelling? You can go Wiz. <laughs> you can call deal. me Jay Wiz. I'm running a special on name changes this month. Oh, good. <laughs> We're, we get you squared away. Oh, thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Well, first off, I did want to point out that um, we will be doing a press release and sending out talking points about the duck blind draw and the changes in it. So we'll all have talking points to speak from so that we're familiar if you get any calls. Um, and you have a bag of goodies in front of you. So do pay attention to that towards the end of the presentation. So, let's see, can you make that full screen? Can I? There it goes. Wonderful. Does this work now? So, I want to just bring you guys up to speed on um, some of our recruitment and retention and outreach efforts since the license year began. And uh, kind of wanted to do that in the frame of what was happening in the world. So, in March, um, we had our first COVID case in Tennessee. Uh, you know, the schools closed down, the restaurants went to to go only, um, gatherings were limited to 10, and the governor put in the do your part, stay apart campaign. And um, we wanted to be very proactive with our communications during this time. So we updated all of our digital ads to um, include some form of distance yourself outdoors or responsible recreation and using some of that verbiage in our ads so that we're making sure that people understand that fishing and hunting and those traditions, boating, um, those are safe. Those are things that are open that you can go do right now. We sent out emails letting people know that they could still get outside during the pandemic um, and where they can go and what TWRA places were open. We sent out turkey hunters um, updates on what they need to change for the season. There were some check-in procedures, uh, some in-person check-in stations that were closed. And so we got all of that information out to folks in a very proactive way. Uh, Don King did some great updated PSAs for us. So radios are like, we're looking to fill space. So they had all of this stuff that was taken up by sports and other things that were going on. And they just had blank air time. So we gave them new PSAs that had um, encouraging people to go hunting, go fishing. And we sent out Wildcast, our agency podcast that Jason Harmon does a wonderful job with. We sent that out to radio stations across the state as well as television because we do video and audio for that. 
I mean, we did the same thing with Tennessee Outdoor Journal, our, our TV series, and uh, that was picked up by several stations. And we started doing this type of content on um, our social media. So um, telling people again, reinforcing that fishing, hunting, those are safe outdoor activities that you can practice social distancing with. Then April, that's when that stay at home was extended, um, that testing increased, number of positive or COVID cases increased. We had that awful tornado in Southeast part of the state and everything was really just shut down the month of April. And that's when our customer behavior changed drastically. Um, I'll talk about it a little more, um, but we wanted to make a concerted effort because all of our customers all of a sudden went online. Everything they did was online. So they needed um, content where, we, where they were. So we made concerted efforts to make more digital content, video style content. Um, this is one, uh, there's a new series that we now make every week called Drop the Tailgate. And uh, Matt Cameron out of Region 4 does a wonderful job with this. And he just literally drops the tailgate and starts talking to people about stuff. Everything from hunting morel mushrooms to making a wing bone turkey call to, um, you know, so many different things. He's done mouth calls. He did a lot of turkey stuff because it was turkey season. So he tries to make it kind of real time and he does a wonderful job. I mean, and you can see the reach of this was over 200,000 people watched this show. Oh, let me go this way. And then we also had to battle a lot of misinformation. There was so much bad information out there. So people were saying, oh, they're closing down turkey season. Oh, they're, you can't go fishing anymore. Oh, you can't. So we leveraged our officers because people trust people with a badge. So we leveraged them to be on camera and tell people what they can do and what we don't want them doing. So um, we were able to use that and we used our own Commissioner Holbert to um, make a couple of announcements that were, were very well received. So a little bit about customer behavior. The month of April, people went straight online and the amount of purchases that were made online increased 100% from the amount of purchases that were online last year. And this is so good for us just because we get good emails, which are very valuable to us. So instead of Walmart at walmart.com or something like that, that some person at an agent is just typing in something in the blank to get through it, not really asking people. Um, when you're doing it yourself, you put in your right information. So um, those are wonderful bits of information to have. And then they're ordering hard cards. So they're ordering those $5 upgraded durable collector's cards, which makes our agency money for doing marketing. That $5 upcharge, we get money off of that to uh, put in our marketing fund. Um, and they're also signing up for auto renew. So that little click, auto renew, so I don't have to do this ever again, that's up 40% compared to last year. And then the hard cards are up 25%. Um, and this all saves the agency money too because when a person purchases a license at an agent, like a Walmart or sporting goods store, we have to pay that agent a fee. When they go and do it themselves, we don't pay a fee. So this is all very positive for the agency. So let's talk a little bit about some great content that we put out there. This was the day that we broke the internet. Um, we put out a quote from our chairman of the commission uh, that turkey season will be open, and this was amid many other states shutting down hunting and not letting non-residents come in and not letting even residents um, go hunting or fishing in some states. And this spread like wildfire. I mean, I'd, I'd never seen a post take off this quickly. It was viral if I've ever seen viral. So this was the day we broke the internet. You see almost 800,000 people reached and uh, really great post. Um, another creative thing, our, our graphic designer, Austin Bornheim, is uh, pretty clever. So this is social distancing TWRA style. We also wanted something for parents, um, knowing that they had kids at home. We wanted to educate them about wildlife and things in their backyard. So we made this backyard bingo, um, things that kids could do at home. We also made a stream side bingo. So there was several activities for kids, and we did some wildlife watching activities. Um, and some, uh, some more content that's pretty cool, just, you know, wash your hands like you've been field dressing a deer. That's how long you need to wash your hands, get them clean. Here's where we were using our officers to uh, tell people what they can do and what we encourage them not to do when they're out on the water or in the woods. 
Um, and we also use social influencers, which is a huge buzzword in marketing right now, but um, using, like, this is Christine Fisher, who's a female professional angler, but her saying how she's getting outdoors right now and that she's doing it in Tennessee and that she's buying a license and sharing that with her crowd <coughs> creates new customers for us. And we did the same thing with uh, country singer Josh Phillips. And my, my favorite group that we did some social influencer marketing with was the hunting public. It's this group of millennial guys that travels around the country and only hunts public yeah, land. So they I came to Tennessee trying to strike a lonely bird. It's getting kind of windy, so that may make it tough. But and this was an example of their Instagram stories. So they made 60 different pieces of content for us. Some was featured on YouTube, some was through their Instagram, some was Instagram stories. Um, but they are a <laughs> certainly different kind of guy than our traditional hunter and angler, and they drove a lot of traffic to our site during this time. So they spent 10 days here hunting on different public areas and uh, it was really well received and it got millions of impressions. Or if you already live in Tennessee, swipe up, send you right over to the page where you can buy your license. Check it out. It's well worth it. And they were very successful here too. So again, um, going back to the next month, May, businesses start to reopen. Some restaurants are starting to reopen and um, most public areas, state parks and everything are opening back up. Um, so we just wanted to keep the content flowing. So we created tackle tips in a did you know segment. Uh, we continued on with COVID updates from our officers. And May was when we started doing boat ramp geofenced ads for recruitment and uh, reactivation of anglers, especially people that own boats that don't have a fishing license. So RBFF gave us a grant to um, select different marinas and boat ramps from across the state. So we're targeting people that have visited those boat ramps with ads for 30 days after they visit, visit that boat ramp and saying, hey, get your fishing license. You can see right there the ad that says tackle boredom. Um, that's what's being served up. And that's Jason Harmon's wife and kiddos. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's been very successful. And so far in just a little over a month, we've reactivated or recruited 3,500 people and spent very little money to do that. And then moving on to June, where now we're, more businesses are open, we're just practicing social distancing, we're wearing masks, there are some spikes in cases. Well, we're just encouraging responsible recreation. So we're doing a lot of hashtag responsible recreation things. Um, we're trying to get back into some of, the, some of the normal swing of things. So we put out some Father's Day ideas about, you know, buy your dad a conservation raffle ticket, a license, you know, give them some ideas about what to do for Father's Day. Um, and we began our community fishing program. Uh, this month, we opened up two lakes for community fishing program, which means we're stocking the ponds at these cool public parks. One being Cedar Hill Park in Madison, and the other one, uh, Dickard Pond in Eastridge. So those lakes in these great public parks that already have great amenities from picnic tables, bathrooms, all of those kind of things that are already set up. So we just go in, stock fish, and then we, um, the fish like a local ad you see there is geofenced in the seven mile radius around that lake. And so we say fish like a local and we serve that ad up to people that are lapsed or people that don't have a fishing license yet. And uh, those uh, drive them to go to that fishing lake that's right there nearby. And let's talk results. So um, these are our audience growth on our social media channels. And you see that big old jump right there in the middle of the screen. That's the day that Commissioner Holbert set the internet on fire. <laughs> so we got tons of new fans that day and tons of new uh, page likes when uh, we got to say that turkey season was open. But you'll see that we have huge increases in audience growth over this time from the beginning of the license year till now. This is a kind of, you know, it looks like our social media is alive. It's got a heartbeat, but this is actually video views. Um, and if you look at um, the, really the only number that I really want y'all to understand here is the top left corner, 2.7 million views of our social media videos over this time, which is over 200% increase from the year prior. So think last year at the same time on our same social media channels, we had a 200% increase 
and video views. Next, we have engagement, and again, lots of wonderful lines and things, but the thing I want you to see here is we've had 1.3, almost 1.4 million interactions with our social media, and that's up 93.7% from last year. So these are huge increases in um, engagement on social media, and that's just telling you all of our folks are going online to see and hear from us. Um, so let's talk about number of licenses sold. In February, you see the green is this year, the yellow is in 2019, the orange is 2018. In February, it's an increase. In March, slight decrease. In April, huge increase. May, huge increase. June, another big increase. And over 30,000 of these customers were recruited or reactivated by direct clicks from digital marketing. So. Overall, total licenses, this isn't total people, this is total licenses, year to date, we are over a million licenses sold. Comparatively to the same date in 2019, 2018, large increase in number of licenses sold. People are going outdoors in droves. So it's something that we need to make sure that we can keep them going outdoors. So another piece of exciting news, so this is total people. Uh, 2019 versus 2020, nice increase. So we're almost at 600 thousand license holders for this year. Um, it's over a hundred thousand brand new people that have never held a license before. That's pretty cool. That's over a hundred thousand beginners that are doing this for the first time ever. And we've reactivated almost 50,000 people that were long-term lapsed, so longer than 18 months. So that's 150,000 people that are back in the sport fishing and hunting that have either never, never done it before or it's been a long time since they've done it. So this is really exciting stuff. So what's happening in the future? We got lots going on, of course. Um, we're going to really re increase retention efforts to hold on to those 150,000 new people. And we're going to do that through social influencers. We're going to do that through brand partnerships. And we're going to do a lot of marketing automation this year, which is going to be really exciting. Um, our education and outreach efforts, such as the cards that you find in your bag there, um, there's a trifold card that was uh, Commissioner Granberry's brainchild and a wonderful one. Um, those kind of tools that are um, old school but effective. So we still have those that we can focus on. Um, and we'll continue with, you know, leave wildlife wild and don't mow if you don't have to mow and all of those types of education and outreach efforts about our agency and our relevancy. We also have a lot of CWD communications that are going to be improved for 2020. One thing that I think is exciting to point out is our hunters asked if we would text them with their CWD results. They don't just want emails, they want to text. And we're doing that this year. So that's something I'm glad that we're able to do. Um, another thing, you might have noticed a couple of hats and stickers and uh, buffs and gaiters in your bag there. Those are all going in our online store, which should be coming online any week now. So July is when we'll roll that out. Um, and our event system. Our event system is rolling out so that we can have events such as STTP or um, any kind of partner event or hunting and fishing academy and all of these things, kids fishing events even, all of these things will be in our license system so that we can now track license behavior based on event attendance so that we know that we're getting return on investment for these things long term. Um, and last but not least, if you haven't bought raffle tickets or encouraged everyone you know to buy raffle tickets, the Tennessee Conservation Raffle is in full swing. So we are excited to have such an expanded <coughs> raffle this year and uh, really exciting results so far. Any questions? Questions? Nobody fell asleep. Jones, Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I think we ought to add um, a rabbit hunting trip with uh, Ed, uh, Ed Carter, our retired executive director. I, I'm game. <laughs> We're trying to sell chances, Jimmy. No. Oh. <laughs> Commissioner Gardner. Yeah, Jennifer. I just want to say. Uh, the presentation is awesome. The the numbers, uh, I, I'd I'd hate to try to keep up with that next year, but I look forward to seeing your results then too. Um, the bingo that you came up with to keep the kids busy, 
I, I think you and your team did a fantastic job with that. I mean, this is a time when, when kids are at home and parents are running out of things to do and, and getting creative ideas from, from places like TWRA is, is uh, crucial to them being able to keep their kids busy, engaged, and off, them, uh, off the TV and, or off the video games. And I think I commend you for that. Thank Very you. Very well done. Thank you. I give credit to that for Austin Bornheim, who designed that, and Mimi uh, Barnes from Region 3. She came up with what went all the little squares. Any other questions for Jennifer? Commissioner Ripley? Wisniewski. Wisniewski. A question, but I, I echo what uh, Commissioner Gardner said. This is tremendous news. This is great, and I hope it continues next year. And I suspect it will. I think we've got new people on board that are really going to get into it. So I'm excited. Thank you. And thank you for calling on me when I didn't ask you to, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. I knew you'd have something to say. That it. Jennifer, great job. Um, you. Your crew's done an excellent job. And it's really exciting. I mean, to see all these new license holders and to see social media and a lot of folks commenting of how they haven't been target hunting in years. It was so great to be able to go back with her. And a lot of them were, were one that made or that was great was two people that turkey hunted every year together, but it had been 10 years since either one of them had been turkey hunting. And they went back together and both killed a turkey that morning. It was really exciting to see that. And I think, uh, I think a lot of these folks will get it in their blood again and, and will renew. So, um, keep that's your job to keep them there. So I'll do it. All right. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks for all you do. Any other comments from the commission? Commissioner McLaren. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'd like to take this time to uh, remind everybody about the Shoot for Hunger. Of course, it's going on right now in West Tennessee is why we're not there, but uh, it'll be right here in Nashville on September the 24th. I'd like to invite commissioners, agency, uh, and hunters that want to get out and fine tune their skills for a good cause. It's uh, helping raise money for uh, Second Harvest Food Bank. So keep that uh, sporting clays event in mind. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner McLaren. Anyone else? Mike Butler. Wanted to invite the commission and any of the staff that would like to come out. Next week is our uh, SCTP state shoot. And we uh, typically have about 2,200 participants. We expect it to be down, but Lo and behold, we had uh, right at 1,600 kids sign up to come shoot next week, and we're going to have uh, over about five or six days. We will be having a lot of distancing and a lot of different protocols, but if you haven't seen the event, it's impressive, and you will get to see some young people that can really handle a shotgun well all the way from 10 years old up to 18 years of age. So we'd want to invite you to come out. If you have an interest, just email me or get in touch with me, and I'll, I'll be glad to set it up where you can come out and get a tour. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Anyone else? Director Wilson? Yep. All right. Joe, I failed to mention earlier, and uh, I know a lot of people don't probably realize it, but I know there was a, a group that worked under you on this duck blind drawing, and it was a lot of hours, and it was a lot of quick work. And I just want to say I appreciate that. If you'd like to say who those were, I don't know, but I don't know who they all were. But I know Richard Kirk's here somewhere and Jason Maxadon, who both had a big part in it, uh, the program managers. But absolutely, those <laughs> these two ladies right here, and and I mean they they've all went through it. Legal staff. It's it's took a, a really a big group effort, and I just want to tell you from the commission of how much we appreciate it and how, how good it is to come in and have a, a really good proposal and not have, to, not have to debate it for two or three hours and, and try to fix it. But we really, I, I really appreciate it, and I think each commissioner does. But thank you guys, girls, for the hard work. All right. Nobody else, then we'll adjourn. <laughs>